Welcome to a town hall webinar about COVID-19 and other topics featuring ASMP General Counsel Tom Madre and ASMP Executive Director Tom Kennedy. Take it away. All right, Doug, and thank you everyone for coming in today. Um, it's great to have you all with us. And as, as usual in the time that we're in, we have an awful lot to cover today. I wanted to begin by also uh, having a conversation briefly before we get to Tom's presentation with Mike Clipper, our copyright counsel, because Mike and I have been working behind the scenes this week to continue to advocate for all of our members and all of the photographic community, really, with respect to the need for more financial aid for small business owners, including all of you. And also, we have been uh, advocating for reforms to the way that the processes are being carried out in the healthcare system so that uh, we can safely reopen the economy at some point and based on the best medical advice of the, the medical professionals who have been advising the president. And we think it's important to also communicate about that and to indicate support for those in Congress who are trying to make sure that hospitals and healthcare providers have all that they need with regard to PPE and ventilators, as well as you know, rolling out a nationwide testing system that actually works and that can uh, be coupled with contact tracing to enable people to really find out who has the virus and how and where it's safe to reopen the economy. So with that is sort of as a preamble, Mike, why don't you bring us up to date on what you're hearing, or maybe more importantly, not hearing this week on Capitol Hill with respect to advocacy. Yeah, well, the first thing we heard this week was the fact that there was, <clears throat> with regard to the next round of legislation, there was serious disagreement between the Democrats and the Republicans on how to proceed. And that got pretty loud between Pelosi, Schumer, and the others. Um, that focal point, that, that's gone quiet. And the, before it went quiet, the issue was Republicans wanted to add $250 billion overall because the money had run out, of, the money was running out and has run out on these programs. And secondly, the Democrats wanted to add new categories and new items to be covered within the federal monies. That's what they were going back and forth on. That got eclipsed when the president went into this discussion between who would be the overall determinator of when to reopen the economy, and that's gone back and forth, as you all know. Today, I was telling Tom earlier, Tom, both Toms, that there has reached a very interesting point, and it goes to what Tom Kennedy just said. There's been quiet, and when there's quiet like this after a lot of yelling, my assumption is that just like they did with the CARES Act earlier, they are behind the scenes now having serious discussions because they know how important it is that they get the next round of legislation going. So my suspicion is that either late today or maybe over the weekend or Monday, we'll hear about that there's progress being made on the next round. I could be totally wrong on that, but when it goes this quiet, you got to think after it was so loud that they're working their way through it. And that, that does not in any way detract from what Tom Kennedy has been leading us on, and that is this constant flow of letters, whether it's to the chairman of the Finance Committee in the Senate or Ways and Means in the House, who are responsible for the CARES Act legislation, and telling them about repeatedly, as are other organizations such as authors, other visual artist groups, and all kinds of small business people, that whatever is done has to have a constant theme that the small business person, an individual business person, needs to be included in all these programs, and that there has to be a better way of getting the money out and, and, and try to avoid some of the problems we've seen, not just with it running out, but the long, the long waits and the inability of too many people not to get funding during the latest round. Tom, I think that's where we are right now, so it's sort of a wait and see game. Right. So, I'm happy to answer questions later, but that's sort of where we are right now. It's a strange time, and I, I suspect it'll break in the next few days. Okay, and one of the things that I just want to let everybody know is I put in the chat box 
a link to the area where uh, our advocacy system where all of you are enabled to write in and connect with your representative and senators to make you know your own personal case for why this uh, relief this additional financial relief is a, is desperately needed by everybody and i'm going to also put in the, a copy of the letter or a link rather to the letter that i sent out to the four leaders the house and Senate leaders this week. And I also um, am going to put in another link that basically shows you where on the site we have information about advocacy. So you can see that when you're, um, you know, when you need to. Uh, so I'm putting those two links into the chat box now. And so I think that's, that's it for right now in advocacy. We'll come back to that later. But um, I want to now turn it over to Tom Madry to begin the presentation about some of the changes and events that are going on with regard to PPP and EIDL. So Tom, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, um, I hope, can everyone hear me? Thumbs up, we're looking good. Um, okay, so what we're, what we're looking at this week is that I think in the last seven days since we spoke exactly this time last week, more has changed uh, than in the previous few weeks combined. And there's been some important changes and some big changes. And uh, so today we're going to be talking about, obviously, the PPP and the EIDL situations. Uh, but we're also going to be talking about new guidance that's come out from the Treasury Department and then we're also going to turn away from COVID-19 for a moment, and we're going to talk about the ruling uh, in the case, the Sinclair case related to Instagram, that we've been getting a lot of questions about. I think this is a good opportunity to say that while these town halls began uh, in the midst of the, uh, the pandemic and all of the related issues, um, it's my hope and Tom Kennedy's hope, I think all of our hopes, that we can continue these type of conversations as we move away from some of the COVID-19 issues into some of the other issues that are affecting our membership and, uh, and photographers around the world. And we're gonna start that today by having a little bit of, of talk about the uh, Sinclair case, what it means for you, because we've been getting a, a number of questions on that. So I'm gonna share my screen and then we're gonna go ahead and get started today. This is our fifth town hall, uh, which um, I gotta say uh, personally is, is kind of exciting. Um, we've been able to come here every week uh, and hopefully get some good information, give you some good information as we, um, as we navigate all of this together. Um, as always, this is going to be and is being recorded. Uh, it will be up on our Vimeo page. There will be slides, uh, a copy of this PDF I'm showing on the uh, Town Hall Archives page, I believe, um, and we will jump in. Now, of course, again, like I mentioned last week, uh, disclaimers. Um, this week is a perfect example of how quickly things are changing and how in the span, uh, right there in the middle of the week, in the span of about 12 hours time, there were, there were three or four major things that happened all at once that upended what you, we may have talked about last week and certainly the week before and the week before that. So you should always check with your CPA, with your tax professional, attorney, advisors, you need to look at your specific situation. And I, I want to take a moment, you know, a lot of you have written in uh, comments to legal at ASMP.org or magic at ASMP.org, and we are trying to get to as many of those as we can. Uh, note that if you ask a really specific question, something like, hey, what do I fill out on this line for this? Uh, my answer may unfortunately be, hey, go check some of the articles we wrote, but we can't give you that very specific advice. Part of that's because we're a trade association, right? And so I don't know your particular circumstances. I want to give you the best advice that we can, but for that specific stuff, you're going to have to check and double check everything that we talked about. So here are some of the changes that just happened in the last week. And I just wrote these out an hour or two ago and, and heck, something may have changed since then. Uh, on April 13th, there was a ruling in this Sinclair versus Ziff Davis case that we uh, are going to be uh, looking at here in a moment. This is a case, if you're not familiar, that deals with embedding of an image 
on a blog site that uh, went through Instagram's embed process. And the photographer said, hey, that's copyright infringement. Well, this week a court held no, it's not copyright infringement and dismissed the case uh, of the photographer. We're gonna spend more time with that. That came out earlier this week. On the same day, there was an email from the Small Business Administration that discussed something I touched on last week. Now recall, last week I'd mentioned there was this one email from Small Business Administration, Massachusetts, that said the way the EIDL advance was gonna be calculated was based on $1,000 per employee up to a maximum of $10,000. That was the first time we had heard about that. And there wasn't corroboration from SBA National or other SBA offices or the Treasury Department or anyone about this until Monday. And on Monday, there was an email from the Small Business Administration that was sent to people who had applied for the EIDL loan in advance. And that email said, yes, the way it's going to be calculated is $1,000 per employee up to a maximum of $10,000 for the EIDL advance. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Next day, new guidance came out from the Treasury Department related specifically to sole proprietor, single member LLC, self-employed people, okay? And that guidance affected, uh, affects the uh, Paycheck Protection Program. Now, less than 24 hours later, everyone ran out of money. The SBA announced that the amount of money appropriated for the EIDL program and EIDL advances is exhausted. And shortly thereafter, uh, there were announcements that the amount of money appropriated for the Paycheck Protection Program um, has run out and no new applications or lenders will be accepted. I know we're going to ask some questions about that. I promise I'm going to get into it. All right. This was all in the last five days. Okay. And um, all of these on their own are significant events and significant changes. And uh, I want to touch on each of these um, a little bit. You might wonder where can you see kind of current guidance and up-to-date things. And that's on the ASMP website at asmp.org slash news. Uh, there are two articles that came out in the last 48 hours that I wrote. One very long one. On, uh, on the Ziff, uh, Sinclair versus Ziff David case, Ziff Davis case, and another one which is ASMP's response to the Instagram ruling and what you can do now. And I updated that even just a few hours ago with a little frequently asked questions section. And then in the last week, we updated all of our posts that are related to the CARES Act that are currently up there, including um, the fact that the PPP EIDL SBA programs are all closed. Um, we updated the, the article on updating. Uh, we updated how to calculate the payroll uh, amount uh, for each individual group. And by the way, that is something that's going to be re-updated uh, based on what I'm about to tell you. Um, and then we updated the other article. All those are up there, asmp.org slash news. There are a lot of articles that get posted, so if you don't see it right on the first page, click through a page or two. You can also click on the category. These are all under the uh, uh, COVID-19 category. The Instagram ones are actually under the copyright category as well. Now, there are four articles that are currently on my little yellow pad here that I'm gonna be writing in as soon as I get to them. The first is one that we've gotten questions about and we haven't been able to turn our attention to. There's a provision in the CARES Act that is the Pandemic Unemployment Insurance or Assistance for Unemployment Insurance uh, Program. That is the thing you keep hearing me say, it's state by state, state by state, right? You have to check with your own state. The PUA is part of the CARES Act, which helps support what the states are doing and has its own provisions. An article will be coming out about that one shortly. In addition, as a side note, um, there was uh, uh, at the various meetings of ASMP leadership this morning, we're gonna be introducing some new resources uh, in the next week that are going to help um, uh, people get a sense of what is available them, to them on a state-by-state -state basis. So stay tuned for that. 
I'm going to write an article on advice for working with your state unemployment office. Um, we have uh, some people, of course, I'm here in Texas. There's a, um, uh, in Texas, it's called the Texas Workforce Commission. We've been reaching out to them to uh, get a, a representative who might be able to answer some good questions. Now, unemployment offices right now are, just like everywhere else, going crazy. Uh, we've had reports of ASMP members who have been on the phone for dozens of hours trying to get through to their state unemployment office um, only to get through and then lose the connection or not get through at all. Um, this is, as I mentioned last week, a mess. While the PPP money did run out for new applications, some ASMP members, photographers, visual creators, small businesses, were notified that they were approved. Very few of them have actually gotten money, but many have been notified that they've been approved. That means money will be coming to them. So in the next week, I'll be writing an article about how to make sure you spend, track, and organize that money so you get the forgiveness provisions of that loan. And then finally, a question that I've gotten a lot in the last 24 hours, should I have hope for additional money for stimulus programs? Should we hope that the PPP and the EIDL will be reallocated as funding? So I want to give you a note of hope, some hope anyway. Uh, you heard Mike Clipper a minute ago say, a lot of times when there's the silence going on, it means there's some behind the scenes wrangling occurring. And Tom Kennedy and I have talked about the fact that um, uh, it would be um, an incredibly unpopular decision to not support uh, putting additional money into the PPP and the EIDL programs. Now, obviously, Tom Kennedy, Mike Clipper, nor I can say that there's going to be money back in there for sure, and it's going to be by a certain date, and it's going to be the right amount. But I personally would be really surprised if there wasn't a reallocation of some funds to that. Because of that, and many banks and lenders are thinking that as well, because of that, what I talk about today with the PPP and the guidance and the EIDL stuff is not just water under the bridge, okay? It's important information because you can be using that information when more money is allocated, then you can make sure you have your ducks in a row. Okay, that's the goal. So let's jump right in. Changes to the EIDL program. As I mentioned earlier this week, the SBA sent out an email and it said in part, quote, the amount of your advance will be determined by the number of your pre-disaster employees. And they show pre-disaster as January 31, 2020. How many employees did you have there? The advance will provide $1,000 per employee up to a maximum of $10,000. That is now the official calculation that will be used for this thing you've heard of since the beginning, this $10,000 advance, $10,000 grant, whatever you wanted to call it, the, the calculation is $1,000 per employee up to a max of $10,000. Well, that begs the question, if you're a sole proprietor, independent contractor, self-employed, you count as one employee for this thing, okay? You don't put zero, you put one for the advance and the EIDL thing, okay? Because you're entitled to this. So if you're a sole proprietor and it's only you, the CARES Act specifically says sole proprietors are eligible. And this specifically says you don't get any money in, unless you're based on how many people are paid. We're talking a lot about taxable income. And we did that a little bit last week. I'm going to talk a lot more about it today. But what you want to do is in this situation, you can count yourself as one. Now, if you have employees, then you know what to do. You have other employees. Earlier this week, Treasury sent out a huge round of new guidance regarding sole proprietors, self-employed, and others, and the Paycheck Protection Program. It's important enough that we are going to spend probably the majority of our time today looking at this. Um, a new article will be coming out over the weekend um, at ASMP related to this uh, and updating old articles as well. Uh, by the way, I'm going to shortly be putting at the top of older articles 
this no longer is valid instead of keep trying to update them. And so be very aware, um, you know, take a look at the stuff that's in bright red and make sure that you're looking at the most recent version. I'm gonna do my best to signal that. Please, 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 please check with your advisors, your bank, your lenders, listen to them. Your bank and lenders are the ones that are giving you the loan. If they say, I need this document, give them that document. Don't tell them, hey, I saw this presentation one day online and so this is all you're supposed to need. Because at the end of the day, what matters is getting the money from the people who have the money. It doesn't matter if it's exactly what the law says. And in many cases, the law is very nebulous as to what is required. So listen to the professionals who are getting you the money. Okay. We're going to do this like some questions because in the treasury guidance, there were a set of questions. I have income from self-employment and file a 1040, Schedule C. Am I eligible for a PPP loan? You are eligible for a PPP loan if you were in operation on February 15th you are an individual with self-employment income, your principal place of residence is the United States, and you filed or will file a form schedule, a form 1040 Schedule C for 2019. If you hit those things, you are. Most sole proprietors, independent contractor, or uh, self-employed individuals, that all counts, okay? You are eligible, let's start there. What if I am a partner in a general partnership? If you're a partner in a partnership, and remember, this changed in the last few days. If you're a partner in a partnership, you may not submit a separate PPP loan application for yourself as a self-employed individual. Instead, the self-employment income of general partners may be reported as a payroll cost up to $100,000 annualized on a PPP loan filed by the partnership. Some banks and lenders were asking for the, uh, uh, the K-1s and the other self-employment reported income. You still may need to give them all that, but this guidance went out to the lenders and banks as well. What this is saying is you can't file for a PPP loan for the partnership, the business, and then also file because you are, quote, self-employed, okay? So this is actually not too far apart from what people were thinking before, but Treasury made it very, very clear here. What if I'm a partner in a general partnership? Essentially what they're saying is you get to go with the PPP loan for the partnership, not you as an individual, quote, self-employed person, which is how partnership income generally, uh, generally is treated on your personal taxes. Okay, note, this is what it says. Everything I've told you so far has been quotes from Treasury. In addition, you should be aware that participation in the PPP may affect your eligibility for state administered unemployment compensation or unemployment assistance programs including the programs authorized by the CARES Act. What does this mean? I, I have no idea. They just put this out in the recent guidance, okay? And the end result of this is simply to s confuse and scare a lot of people. Because remember, what they're saying is if you get a, a PPP loan, then it may affect you at the state level in the state unemployment offices. Again, you're gonna ask me, and I know you're gonna ask me, well, does it in my state? And my answer is gonna be, I really don't know, but even more important, I don't know that the states know in a lot of cases. Because we've talked to people and clients who have contacted their state unemployment office and the state unemployment office, you know, some uh, in the same state, sometimes they say the PPP, then you can't, if you file for this, you can't file for that. And sometimes they say, no, it's just fine. And what if you get the loan and don't accept it, or you uh, don't get the loan or whatever the case is. This is really up in the air right now. We're gonna try to put some parameters around this in the next week or two, but 
Treasury put this into the document and I wanted to note it for you because they're noting it for you, okay? And what that means to me is there, there's some states are gonna use this as a shield to prevent doing some things and not doing others, right? How do I calcu calculate the maximum amount I can borrow and what documentation is required? And you may be sitting there, especially if you were not here at the very beginning and say, hey, all the money's run out, so why does it matter how I calculate things? Remember, it is the belief of almost every person that I've talked to that money will be allocated to these programs again. There will be another round of funding for these programs. All of the funding here ran out in 13 days. That's an incredible uptake and shows incredible need, okay? That being said, we don't know when and we don't know how much, but I want you to be ready. I want you to be ready. And this is the first time, almost two weeks after the program opened, this is the first time Treasury's actually come out with specific guidance for sole proprietors and self-employed individuals. So pay attention. How do I calculate the maximum loan amount I can borrow and what documentation is required? If you have no employees, this is the calculation you use. Okay, bear with me. For purposes of this, if you're a sole proprietor, you follow this calculation because you don't have employees other than yourself. The, that little editor's note in blue and uh, yellow there is something I wrote in because I think this is very confusing how they wrote it. If you're applying for the EIDL, you say you are one because you're one employee, you have taxable payroll income that comes through your Schedule C, right? But here, it, it, this really should say, if you have no employees other than yourself as a sole proprietor, here's the calculation. This is almost exactly what I told you last week, so I feel good about this. Find line 31 on your Schedule C. If it's over $100,000, lower that number um, to, a hundred hundred thousand dollars, right? So what it's saying is you can't have more than a hundred thousand dollars in the calculation. There should be a period after number. There's not. Sorry, that looks confusing. I'll fix it. If your line 31 on your Schedule C is less than zero or zero, you cannot get a PPP loan. They've made this now explicit. Remember we kept talking about what counts. And after last week's town hall, I got a lot of questions about owner's draws because we spoke about owner's draws in how they can be incorporated in here. And if you didn't watch the video for last week's town hall, within 24 hours of posting it to Vimeo, I filmed another 10 minute intro to that where I really dug into this because I don't think I was as clear as I could have been on this. The only money you can include in your calculation of a PPP amount is money that's considered payroll taxable. You have to be able, you have to pay payroll taxes on the amount of money that you're claiming. If you are showing a net income line of zero, that means that you don't have to pay any payroll taxes on anything because you didn't make any money and therefore that's not part of your calculation, okay? Treasury made this clear just a few days ago. What about owner's draws? Okay, here's the, here's the, the tricky part. Owner's draws count if they are payroll taxable and you're a sole proprietor, for sure, because those would go into the calculation of line 31 on your Schedule C. You're a single member LLC, you're a sole proprietor, you take owner's draws, those count as long as they're subject to payroll tax by virtue of being on your Schedule C in line 31. Good to go. But what about S-Corps and C-Corps and any other type of distribution or draw that's not a sole proprietorship? The question you have to figure out 
is, is that money that you got from your business subject to payroll taxes or not? There's your answer. If you have an S Corp and you have a W-2 income, that's clear, that's subject to payroll taxes. But what if you also take owner's draws? Now, I talked with a few accountants about this. By and large, if you take owner's draws in addition to a W-2, those owner's draws are not subject to payroll taxes. That's not always the case. And this is why I keep going over, you've got to take a look at your specific information. If those draws, if those distributions are subject to payroll tax, then you get to include them. If they're not, then you don't. How does it work in your situation? You gotta look at your taxes. You gotta look at how these things are calculated. Bottom line, most of the members are sole proprietors. Owner's draws from, uh, uh, for a sole proprietor, as long as they're part of the calculation that gets to your Schedule C, you absolutely include them. Other than that, you absolutely include everything that's subject to payroll taxes. That's the key, payroll taxes. What I said last week holds for this week. It's not how much you made, it's how much you paid. If you're, a, if you're a, an S-Corp and you make a lot of money and you pay yourself as a W-2 and you only pay yourself a portion of that money, then it's about what you paid to your employees. What you paid to the employees is what matters. Okay. All right. So how do you do it? Sorry, I digress. How do you do this if you have no employees, meaning you're self-employed, sole proprietor, something uh, similar? You find line 31 on your Schedule C. Uh, you divide whatever that amount is by 12 to get your average monthly payroll, uh, monthly net profit amount. You then multiply whatever you got in step two by 2.5. And then you add in any money that's being refinanced from a currently uh, accepted uh, outstanding amount on an EIDL loan. And if you got any part of that $10,000 advance, you subtract that because you don't have to pay that back. That's a lot, and I get it, and that's why you'll be able to download this. But more importantly, go download this from treasury.gov. That's where I got all this information. It's in this thing called interim final rule uh, for uh, something, something. We'll look at it. I'm going to pull it up while Tom and, and Mike are talking about something else in a second so we can look at it. How do you calculate the maximum amount uh, and what documentation is required if you, are, uh, if you do have employees? Well, you do the same thing except instead of uh, you add in a step. Step two is you add in all the appropriate taxable payroll costs that are listed in the CARES Act. We went over those last week. Uh, you can see those all in the screen. I'll show you in a moment. Exactly the same, the rest of it. All right, important and brand new. And by brand new, I mean last week and all the weeks previous, we talked about certain banks are requiring some documents, certain banks are requiring other documents. The Treasury's made this super clear. Regardless of whether you have filed a 2019 tax return with the IRS, you must provide the 2019 Form 1040 Schedule C with your application, as well as some other proof, and we'll talk about that in a moment, that you are self-employed. There are lots of banks who did not require a 2019 tax return or a 2019 Schedule C when you applied for this loan. And you may be saying, do I have to go and redo things? No, you are, the Treasury has specifically said, you get to work under the guidance that was active at the time. Now, your bank will likely come back to you now that this guidance has been um, provided and say, no, nah, I need that 2019 Schedule C. If you had already been approved and your bank has what they need and they feel good about it, great. Don't rock the boat. Don't start sending them stuff. But be prepared that now Treasury has said explicitly, you have to include your 2019 Schedule C with your application. 
I mentioned last week, a lot of people haven't done their taxes because just a few weeks ago, they said, hey, taxes aren't due till June because of all this stuff that's going on. No such luck here. You have to get those taxes done. And certainly in the next round of PPP, banks are going to be asking for this because this is what Treasury said. All right. A couple more questions. And then I know I've been running long. I may throw it to Tom and Mike for a quick talk, and then I may do some Instagram stuff, but I know we want to get to some questions. It's a little longer today because there's a lot going on. More guidance from Treasury, same document I'm referring to. Question, how can PPP loans be used by individuals who have self-employment income and file a Schedule C? You can use the money you get from a PPP loan for owner compensation replacement. That amount is based on your net profits. Let's say your net profits were $100 and you got 2.5 times that, $250. You can pay back $200 for owner compensation replacement because it's based on net profit. This is new stuff. This is stuff that Treasury hadn't told us before. The other stuff is old stuff. You can use it, of course, for employee payroll costs mortgage interest payments, business rent payments, business utility payments. Here's something new. You must have claimed or be able to claim a deduction for those expenses, business rent, business utility, mortgage interest, on your Schedule C to be eligible to use this money to pay those expenses. Brand new. Okay. Interest payments on other debt obligations incurred before February 15th are also something you can use that money for. Now you may be saying, wow, you went through that really fast and I want to know more about it. Great, I'm writing an article here in the next few days on how to use money from the PPP so that it gets entirely forgiven. And this one slide, we're gonna make into a full article. It's gonna be good to go, okay. The reason I'm going fast is that almost no one has gotten money from a PPP. So this doesn't necessarily, this is not time sensitive. The other stuff is more important. All right, one more quote from them. The administrator in consultation with the secretary determined that it is appropriate to limit self-employed individuals who file using a 1040 Schedule C uses of loan proceeds to those sorry, there's an extra 10 in there, to those types of allowable uses for which the borrower made expenditures in 2019. Here's what that means. They are looking at what, you, what your expenses were in 2019, and they're holding you to that. Meaning, let's say you did not own a place in 2019, so you had no mortgage interest payment. But now you get this PPP loan and you're like, well, now I can buy that building I always wanted and use some of that money to pay the mortgage interest. Based on what they're saying here, I don't think that will work. What they seem to be saying is that you have to have had incurred those expenses in 2019 to be eligible to be forgiven if you use this money to pay those in 2020. This is something I have a pin in because I'm not entirely sure how this is going to play out. One, two more, and then I'm going to throw it back to Tom. What documentation will be required to submit to my lender with my request for loan forgiveness? Now, quick aside, the minute the money hits your account, an eight-week clock starts going. What you spend this money on in that eight weeks is what they look at as the forgiveness period. You gotta spend that money in that eight weeks if you want it to be forgiven and you have to use it for the right things. At the end of that eight weeks, your bank or lender will allow you to prove to them that you use the money in the right way for the loan to be forgiven. In addition to a borrower certification form, if you have employees, you have to provide a Form 941 and state quarterly wage and unemployment insurance tax reporting forms. If you use this money for to pay rent, mortgage interest, or utilities, you have to have evidence of that. You have to have invoices from your landlord. You have to have uh, bills from your utilities. 
the form, the 2019 Schedule C must be used to determine the amount of net profit allocated to the owner for the eight week period. Let's say for whatever reason, you get a $20,000 PPP loan and your net income was only some amount, but there were some calculations that made it larger. And you say, well, 75% of it has to be used to pay payroll costs. And according to the PPP, I as a sole proprietor, that's my payroll cost. And so I'm gonna pay myself $20,000 but my net income last year, I paid myself you know, $100 and my net income was lower than this and that, all that kind of thing. They're gonna say, no, it's your 2019 Schedule C that has to be used to determine the amount that can be allocated to the owner for the eight week period. A lot more info is coming out on this because remember, this is part of the forgiveness side. No one's really gotten money yet so it's something we don't know all the answers to. I expect Treasury will come out with more guidance on that. Now is the time to get ready for this. Again, this is not something you should, you should say, well, there's no more money, I'm not gonna do it. Here's a personal aside. You can imagine that I filed for a PPP pretty early on, and I like to think that I filled it out correctly. That was 13 days ago. And Chase sent me an email this morning saying, I wasn't approved in the first round of things. And so they have my application. And if the government gives them more money, then they will get to my application. Well, that sucks. And I know many of you are in the exact same position. Now is the time to get ready. What should you be doing? You should be getting that Schedule C together if you're self-employed or sole proprietor because now Treasury said you have to have it and they're going to ask you for it. That means do your taxes, find your expenses, call your CPA, do what you got to do because they're going to ask you for this stuff. Okay. What else can you do to get ready? Really make sure that all the things we just talked about and all the things that Treasury says you have to have, meaning Examples of state unemployment things, if you have employees, Form 941, uh, 1099 miscellaneous related stuff. Make sure you have all that stuff. Now is the time to get ready. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a second because that was longer than I normally go. Uh, Tom, do you and Mike wanna talk a little bit about uh, the Case Act and a few other things? And then I'm gonna to touch on Instagram and then we're gonna do questions, I promise. Sure, that sounds great. Thank you, Tom. And thanks for all that great information. It's fantastic to have you as a partner in terms of keeping our members informed and those who are attending these town halls informed of the rapidly evolving landscape that surrounds the financial aid that's being offered as a result of laws being passed in Congress. Mike and I have not taken our eye off the ball with respect to the CASE Act. And while that's probably not top of mind for most of the people on this call today. We have been focused also diligently on trying to see what we can do to move the ball so that we can get this passed because we recognize that being able to protect your intellectual property is something that's gonna be really important as we come out of the pandemic. So uh, one of the things that we've been doing, and Mike has been part of a very small group of pe uh, people representing the different visual groups, working in concert with the Copyright Alliance to continue negotiations with key members of the Senate on both sides of the aisle who are influential as co-sponsors of the CASE Act. And they've been engaged with Senator Wyden. And most of you know, Senator Ron Wyden from Oregon has put a hold on the CASE Act, which prevents it from being passed. It's S-1273, that's the bill. And we've been working diligently since last September to try to move him off his hold so that we can get this bill passed and, this, uh, and get enacted into law a, the bill that would allow for the creation of a small claims tribunal in the copyright office to hear infringement cases of a certain value. And so Mike, why don't you talk about where you think we are with regard to that ongoing negotiation and while Mike does that, I am going to put two links in the chat box. One link deals with, that is again, one of our uh, phone to action campaigns that allows you all to write into your senators and asking them specifically to sponsor the bill. That will be the first link I put in. 
And then the second link that I put in will be a link to a campaign that goes directly to Senator Wyden, asking him why he continues to oppose a bill that makes such good sense for the creative community and that's so necessary for the creative community. So I put those links in. Mike, why don't you take it from here? Okay, thank you, Tom. Um, we have been negotiating for several months through the offices of Senator Durbin and Senator Kennedy with Mr. Wyden's office. Mr. Wyden is a longtime critic of copyright, and as he has done in the past, he typically tries to hold up copyright bills to get changes to his liking. And that's the process that's been ongoing for the last few months. Um, the last conversations that were had between Senate staff for Wyden and for Durbin and Kennedy was two weeks ago. When we, when we replied to their latest suggestions for new language and we had not heard back it was a casual conversation just to let people know that they, you know, they were on it, but we have not gotten a formal response from the Wyden office. Um, over those two weeks, we had pretty much decided along with the Copyright Alliance and others to sort of step back from the intense intensity of the language we were using with Mr. Wyden. In the past, we have indicated that we felt he was not acting in good faith and that implying that his main goal here was to slow down the bill so we run out of time. Um, that's our characterization. He disputes that, um, how much he's involved and knows about what his staff is engaged in is less clear. But in the last two weeks, so for a few weeks during the height of the virus, not to say it is abated by any means, um, we have toned down our rhetoric and focus more on getting co-sponsors for the bill, which I'll explain why in a minute. However, in the last few days, um, because we hit the two week mark, we've made it known to the Senate people that our frustration is going. And Tom in particular has made very clear, and I think he's reflecting the views of people on this call, that while it didn't make sense to be engaging perhaps in the level of the intense rhetoric that we were for a few weeks, the fact we got you know so little response in the interim, we've made a decision, and we'll talk about this perhaps Monday, Tom. We have a week, weekly call that's been on hold, which I suspect may be coming back with the Copyright Alliance, the Authors Guild, and other proponents of the bill. But I think from ASPM's perspective, and Tom, you can speak better to that, we've reached the point where we really are getting frustrated and hoping that we can prevent them from trying to run out the clock, which may or may not be their specific goal. There, were, there was movement earlier on in the last month before the, we were all overrun by the virus problems. And we were hopeful at that point, whether or not the latest slowdown has been because of the virus and the people being in, you know, involved in different activities, I can't tell you. I will tell you, that the same people who do copyright for many members, because I've been in touch with them, are also knee deep in virus issues. So it's not inconceivable that Wyden's people have been similarly employed to work on it, and that could account for some of the delay. But irrespective of that, I think we've reached the point where we have to push back. And that means our negotiating team has gotten the word back to the Durbin and the Kennedy offices that we have to pick up the intensity again after this relative, you know, quieter period. But it also means something else, and this goes to everybody on the phone today, because you all have senators. We, Tom will supply you, and we'll put it up again on the website, Tom, the list of co-sponsors and non-co-sponsors of the CASE Act in the Senate. Every, and we'll put up letters, I think we have we have several versions. We'll, Tom and I will sort through them and get the right one up. But we have decided it's time to go after the, all the co-sponsors on the bill and tell them that we're concerned that time is running out and after this multi-year effort, a great time and expense to small associations like ASMP that cannot be tolerated anymore. 
and we really need them to go forward and co-sponsor. The reason why we need co-sponsors is a procedural one. Mr. Wyden has a hold, which is basically a bar to Mr. McConnell, the majority leader, from calling up the bill and asking for unanimous consent to proceed. Mr. McConnell is always reluctant, and past leaders have been as well, to take up legislation and use time of the Senate if he knows it's going to result in a potential objection and, and filibuster, et cetera. The reason that if we don't break Wyden's hold, then we have to go to McConnell and convince him of the need to proceed and basically run over Wyden's hold. The way we will do that is by increasing the number of co-sponsors of the CASE Act. So I, I, we will be putting up new materials on this. So they're actually, they've been up there, but we'll, we'll update them, I guess is the best phrase, Tom. Yeah. And we will be urging every member of ASMP, starting with those of you on the phone today, to write to your particular senator with a letter that we will have composed for you and you can change as you see fit. The other thing I will ask, as I've done in the past, if any of you on the phone have a relationship with a senator where you've worked at him because you did photographs as others have done at state capitals and developed relationships when they were in state government and moved up to the feds to become senators, whatever, let us know ASAP, because we've had luck in the past when we've found members who could, who could actually reach out and have conversation with a senator who they had a past relationship. So while we will continue negotiating, the role you guys can play is, very, is a critical one, and it will be really putting the heat on to increase the numbers of co-sponsors so Mr. McConnell will be more emboldened to take up the bill. Tom, that's basically where we are now. I don't okay. know. That's great. No, that's that's sufficient, Mike. Thank you. And it will, if there's any questions at the end, we can certainly take them, put them in the chat, in the, sorry, in the question and answer box. Okay. That's great. Thanks. Tom, I'm going to ask a couple of questions getting started from the ones that we received from registrants as they came in yesterday and last night. Sure. And one that I think is really uh, central from Bob Handelman really gets to one of the issues involved, and that is how do, are you advising those on the call today to consider the relationship between PPE, PPP sorry, and unemployment? Uh, if one, if, assuming that you may be approved for both or one or the other, what do you see as the relationship between the two? And how should uh, members be thinking about application if they haven't heard one way or the other? Yeah, um, uh, you know the question the the question here to me is we have a program that has run out of its appropriations, right? So that means money is no longer uh, no longer there. Um, we don't know if it's going to be funded. We hope so. We might think so, but we don't know for sure, right? And so the way that I look at this is that you have to do what's in the best interest of you and your family and your situation. What that means to me is that if you have applied for these various programs and you have not been accepted to this point, you haven't gotten an email that says I'm accepted and you are in need of help, you definitely should go get in line with your state unemployment office because all of these things from federal to state, every part of it, you have to fill out applications and you have to do that by getting yourself in the door somehow, right? And so um, the should you wait on unemployment while we figure out if the PPP and EIDL programs are going to be given more money? My vote is no. You have things, you have you have to do this in your life, right? Um, and so do not, do not exclude a possibility based on what is still a hope, a likely hope, but a hope nonetheless. As far as when you make that determination, my gut says make that determination sooner than later, just because everything takes a long time to deal with. Everyone is overloaded. 
everything is stressed right now, the systems, the institutions. So to answer that question, I think what I would say generally is you got to keep an eye on the programs that you've applied for on the business side, but right now there's no more money there. And so I would not count on that until we get money back in those coffers. I still think you should apply for those and get ready to apply for those, but don't count on it for the be all and end all. Okay, another question that's, that's certainly top of mind for some photographers, and that is from David Bracity. What advice do you have for people who are living off of their savings at this point in time, and they're not necessarily uh, receiving government assistance? Is there going to be any government assistance that you would recommend other than the loans that are part of the EIDL program or the PPP program? Yeah. Um, uh in general, the, the programs that are, that are meant to act as stimulus programs don't have much capacity to pay back people who have used their savings for, and I'm not talking just about this, I'm talking about across the whole spectrum of stimulus programs in the last few decades. That's not to say there's nothing. Um, and that may be something that uh, we can look more into and I can see what provisions are there um, uh, at all. Um, but one thing that is there are there's some other options in the CARES Act besides the EIDL, the PPP, and the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Programs. Those are the big ones. Those are the headlines. There's also things like employee credits, right? There's also things like if you pay yourself <coughs> There are social security uh, tax payment de uh, deferrals right now. Quick example, <clears throat> I logged on to pay my, my employees the other day on the 15th and my payroll provider said, check here if you want to defer the social security tax part of these employee payments until a point in the future. It's not that I don't have to pay them at all, but that, clicking that box may prevent me from diving into my savings right now. And it gets the ball down the road a little bit more. What I really want you to be thinking about is, is we got these big programs and we really hope they're going to do exactly what they say, you know, what we say they're going to do. But um, uh, there are lots of little provisions as well. And one of the things I want to start looking at is ways to, activate those smaller provisions in the CARES Act that may help with what you're talking about. But is there someone who's going to write you a check for the savings that you've already input? No, it's going to come in the form of tax deductions, tax credits, um, uh, deferrals on things. Um, the stimulus programs where people are writing checks are the $1,200 payment that I hope some of you got this week um, in your bank accounts. Um, the EIDL and the PPP are the biggest ones. Okay. And then this is a question that I think we are going to be addressing, you know, both in the writing that you're creating for us that you mentioned earlier, but also what you, uh, what we talked about as a subject for next week and much of our focus next week. And that is the difference between unemployment insurance and the pandemic unemployment assistance. And, yeah. how those should be navigated by photographers, particularly sole proprietors. And this is several uh, people asked uh, versions of this question in the, in the questions that came in last night. Yeah. And uh, Tom, both you and I have heard uh, from members who have been, um, who have run into this issue. Uh, we've heard anecdotes from members who have had experiences with their state unemployment offices where some states have said, yes, you can concurrently apply for the pandemic unemployment assistance side, that's that extra $600 a week that was part of the CARES Act, at the same time that you apply for state unemployment. Other states have said, no, you have to apply for state unemployment, which you will be denied for because you're an independent contractor or, or self-employed, but only once you get that denial can you then apply for the pandemic unemployment side of things. We've heard other stories that have said uh, unemployment offices don't even have the forms for the, the PUA side of, of, of what's going on. Not surprising to me. Um, and recently here in Texas, one of my clients reached out 
and said, you know, I called the unemployment uh, office the other day and stayed on hold for five hours, finally talked to someone, asked them a direct question, and they gave you a direct answer. I submitted things, and then they got an email saying, this isn't correct, you did it wrong, do something different. Um, the interplay between the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance part of the CARES Act and the state uh, unemployment issues, I was hoping by this point would have the major wrinkles would have been ironed out. They have not been. When we start developing some of this material, what we're going to be doing is talking how things should be going, right? And also talking how things are going. And I know that many of you have had experiences with your state unemployment office. And by all means, send those to us. Let me know what's going on. You know, there are, <laughs> there are 50 states and, and, and districts and other things, you know, with, that this counts. This is a federal program. And so the territories are involved, everything else. So we really want to keep a, a close eye on how this is acting in practice. But look next week for a lot more guidance on state unemployment issues. My team back at my office is already focused on this. And frankly, we're focused on it because there's been a big pause button on the EIDL and the PPP, right? So now let's see if we can get to some of these other provisions and give you guys some help there. Okay. And this is one that's more on the health side of things from Anna Versala. Are fashion models required to wear masks during a photo shoot? And I presume this means in areas where uh, the governor has mandated that everyone wear masks when outside. Yeah, I think that's a great question. So what, where I'm going to, to say on this one is, you gotta look at exactly the wording of the mask order, because I'll give you a great example. Less than 24 hours ago in Dallas County, where I am, our uh, county judge, which is what they call him down here in, in Texas, uh, put out the, the next version of this rule, and um, where you have to wear facial coverings while in public, but there are a few provisions. One says, while not social distancing in the six foot radius, you don't have to wear it while you're exercising. You don't have to wear it when you are part of the essential business, but you do have to wear it if you're a non-essential, if you're um, visiting an essential business. And what I say there is, does a model have to wear a mask? No, I think that would generally defeat the point of the photo shoot. Now, what if the provision is written in a way that requires that to be the case? Well, then that, in my mind, is a force majeure <laughs> provision because you have been given an instruction by a governmental entity that you cannot do what you need to do to complete your contract, right? Second side of that, that was the legal side. Second side of this is the liability side. Boy, I would, I would be real careful with... Um, hosting a photo shoot in my studio where I had a number of people coming in who I wasn't sure, um, you know, what their, um, what their adherence was to social distancing measures, where they've been traveling, that kind of thing. Got to be careful about that. If you have a photo shoot at your studio and you bring in a model over here and you bring in your client rep over here and then everyone goes and a week later, people are sick in the mix, you don't know who did what and who brought what where, that is, that's a, that's a concerning, that could be concerning on a liability side. Bottom line okay. on this, check your, uh, check what the order says and also have good policies internally in your business about how you deal with this stuff. Okay, and now let's switch, take one in from our Facebook feed from Megan. She said in an article you wrote, please expand, or in an article you write rather, please expand on the interest paid on debt prior to February. Does this mean that it could include interest on a business credit card that's being used for business expenses? I'm gonna do exactly what you recommend in that question and include the details and provisions in an article that I'm writing about how to use this money for it to be forgiven. 
I don't off the top of my head recall the exact category of things that um, would fall under a prior business debt. Uh, I will find out what that is. And let me, uh, and so look for that in an article. And, and you might have just heard me say, I will find out and I'll get back to you. I have a great example of that right now. Last week, there was a question. And the question talked about um, if you apply for an EIDL loan with the SBA and you're denied, in the future when you're filling out applications, it always asks you, have you been denied for a federal loan and that kind of thing. I thought that was a really interesting question and I didn't have an immediate answer. But Doug Pizak, who actually puts together many of these great webinars uh, on the technical side, uh, spoke with uh, Marlise Fisher, who is the Utah and Nevada regional president for Washington Federal Bank. And here's what Marlise had to say about this issue. This is a quote. The short answer is this. The SBA may be using the same application forms to process the EIDL grants program, but it does not mean you're applying for a loan with the SBA outside of the EIDL grant. In the future, when asked if you were ever denied a loan, the answer would be no, as you did not apply for nor request a loan. But with this caveat, the SBA has been changing their rules and process every day. Okay, this tracks with what I would have guessed, and that is that you won't be penalized for not being able to be part of these programs in the future if you're looking for an SBA loan. Caveats, like she said, Everything is changing all the time. Second caveat, and this one is from me, this is one professional person's opinion, but still one opinion, okay? And what all of the professional world is trying to do, and this includes lawyers like myself and accountants and everyone else who is trying to pro provide advice here. So we're trying to provide advice that is going to help you, but at the same time, we have to be aware that things are changing all the time. And so it's gonna be very hard sometimes to get a straight answer. I try really hard to give you a straight answer here as much as I can. On this one, I am gonna trust in what uh, Ms. Fisher says. And what she says is that this will not uh, hurt your credit when you are applying for a new loan in the future. That tracks with what I would think. That's what we're gonna go with for the moment. If that changes, I'll let you know. That's a good example of how we pick up questions I promise to answer the following. Okay, Tom, here's another one from Tom Kelly. What if we filed already as two individuals and not under the t our partnership? We, and they, uh, he and his partner are in a partnership. And then yeah. in, if they either get turned down or it's discovered that they both have applied individually, although they're actually in a partnership when it comes to looking yeah. at the tax documents. So I think what we're talking about here is on the uh, Paycheck Protection Program side. Um, a minute ago in my presentation, I had a special slide about the Treasury is now giving guidance to general partnerships. And they said, if you're a partner in a general partnership, then you have to apply for the PPP loan through the partnership and not through you as individuals. And so the question is, if they did it as individuals and not through the partnership, is that going to mess everything up? The, the short answer, and this is based on my talking with now close to 10 people who are in banks or lenders associated with this program, is no. And the reason is the bank may come back and likely will come back and ask you for some other documents. But it's not like you get kicked out of the program because you filed before Treasury had put out guidance specific to your situation. Okay. And so um, almost to a person, everyone I've talked to in the bank and lending world has said it is far more important to get your application in, to get in line, to have it reviewed, than it is to make sure that you are always up to date on which document you need. I would rather you have gotten that application in two weeks ago, and the treasury guidance just came out, you know, a day or two ago. And so it would not, you could not have, have known what they were gonna say on it. It's better to apply than it is to wait. And waiting based on everything I've talked to, the, all the people I've talked to at the banks, is, is that you, they will review your application. And then if they need more info, they'll contact you. 
Other thing to be aware of, let's say everyone gets money, the partnership, you uh, as an individual, the other partner, don't take all that money. And if they just deposit it in your account, don't spend it. If every, if you think you got double the money you're supposed to get, well, the government's going to figure that out sometime. So you want to really segment out and contact the bank or the lender and say, hey, something went on here. I know there's been a lot of confusion. I just want to make sure I'm on the right side of everything. Let's look at this and tell me what to do now. That would, you know, that's how you deal with that. Okay, here's one from Sophia Vanderdees in Houston. I have filed for both PPP and the EIDL uh, early on. Now that the funds have run out, should I also attempt to file for unemployment? Because presumably uh, in the question, she hasn't gotten those funds yet. Yeah. Um, yeah. And this, you know, this is, is similar to the first one we discussed and a question we've been getting a lot. And uh, the answer to me is if you are underemployed, meaning you have less work, you're unemployed, or if you in some way work in a situation where you've been furloughed, and you're waiting on these PPP and EIDL stuff, you haven't heard anything back, absolutely go and file for unemployment assistance with your state. I don't see a downside. Let's say you get it, and then two weeks later you get a PPP loan. You call your state and you say, I don't need that money anymore, and you give it back, and I guarantee your state's not going to say, no, you keep it. It's going to be all right. And so go file for unemployment. Don't be waiting on these programs anymore because the money has run out. And despite the best efforts of Tom and Mike Clipper, you know, it's, uh, uh, we don't know when and how much it's gonna be funded again. Uh, we really hope it's gonna be funded. And I really personally believe that it will be to, to some level and at some point, but don't let that prevent you from going to the unemployment uh, assistance office. Okay, and this is a, kind of a variant of that from Sarah. Did anyone, has anyone successfully received the $600 stimulus check? That's the one to the group, and I guess people can answer in the chat box if they have. But it also says that payment status was not available. I was previously approved for unemployment insurance. What do I need to do now? Okay, we're talking about a few different things, so I want to break that down. The uh, you said 600. I'm going to, I think what you're referring to is the $1,200 payment, which is the individual payment that is coming from the IRS to all people, all taxpayers, right? Um, and other eligible people that many people that was deposited into their bank accounts this week. That is actually flowing. It's not great. There's glitches. There's a lot of stuff going on, but if you in the past number of years had been using direct deposit to get any kind of IRS refund, a lot of those people this week found some money in their accounts, okay? Now, the IRS has a tool on their website that says, where's my payment? And you go in and you put your social security number and your name and your zip code, and it's supposed to tell you, uh, you know, if that's been sent to you or not. That didn't work for a lot of people and still isn't working. And so if you got a notice that said, you know, we can't, we don't know the status of your payment, that could mean one of like 10 things. I, I don't think that, I don't think that's working well right now. I wouldn't necessarily count on that. That is individual stimulus as part of actually not the CARES Act, the one before that, I believe, um, that came out of the, uh, of, of Congress. Um, and that is starting to flow now. I would expect that over the next month or so, most people that would be eligible for that will have received that either via paper check or direct deposit. Uh, and then you also said you were approved for unemployment. Those two things don't have anything to do with each other as far as I can tell. Um, it's not like you'll be denied unemployment because you received a stimulus check. Uh, those are very separate things. You don't have to apply for the stimulus check unless you haven't been filing tax returns, in which case there are some provisions, and frankly, I can find those out, but that's very much on the individual side. You do have to apply for unemployment assistance from your state. Okay, and this is from Kurt Leonbeck. 
My annual insurance premium is coming due. I am debating whether or not to suspend my liability in inland marine policies. No productions for the foreseeable future. Any thoughts, Tom? Before suspending your insurance policies, you want to take a close look at what they're actually covering and what what they're actually covering and what you are what the policy says you're allowed to do and not do. Meaning, even if you have one insurance policy and it covers the uh, liability on set and when you're doing stuff, it may also cover or part of it may cover your equipment from being stolen. Well, you might want to talk to your insurance company to make sure that you retain the part that matters now and you don't retain the part that's costing you money because you're not shooting. The only caveat is you may have an insurance policy or an insurance company that would not look uh, kindly on stopping and starting. I do think that's fairly rare, though. Um, the What I would do is I would go find the... Um, uh, I would go find whoever is giving you the insurance or the agent or broker you worked with and call them up and ask them. Uh, I actually had a totally unrelated to all this insurance question for one of my clients the other day. I was able to get in touch with someone. Um, they were uh, relatively happy to not talk about something that is uh, immediately directly related to uh, COVID-19, even though it was tangentially related like your thing is. Um, and, uh, and find out from the horse's mouth for sure. But I don't see any problem in stopping that if you don't have any productions for the foreseeable future. Okay. This is from Brian Schilling, and I love the way you've asked this, Brian. What is the line in the sand that should help me make the decision and separate the idea of applying for the EDL versus applying for unemployment? One, and I, I have two lines in the sand, uh, and it depends on a choice uh, or uh, uh, what you've already had happen. If you've gotten a notice from your bank that your loan has been approved, not that they've received your application, but your loan has been approved. What that generally means is that the loan has gone through the bank to the SBA, the SBA has approved it, it's now back at your bank, and now all you're waiting for is money. If that's the case, it's likely you'll get your money within five to seven days is what I've been hearing lately, after you're notified that your loan has been approved. Some people got that notification today, okay? If you are going to get the money that you need to keep your business going, to keep that side of things happening, then you may not want to file for unemployment assistance. If your loan has not been approved or you haven't heard anything, then you, the line in the sand to me, it's not even a line in the sand. You go and apply for the assistance that you need. This is why that assistance is there. One thing that I think is important is, you know, um, this is affecting all of us at once and photographers very directly and other visual creators very directly. You should not feel that there is any kind of stigma in getting unemployment assistance in applying for these loans. It is a reflection on nothing except a pandemic. And I've heard from some clients and, you know, I'm down here in Texas where they have their own views on independence. And they say, well, I would never do that. And that's government assistance and that's X, Y, Z. And if you are thinking that at all, I want you to put those thoughts away. This is not a reflection on you. This is a reflection on the world. So what is the line in the sand? Think about if you've been approved for that loan. And if not, by all means, go do the thing that you need to do to help protect you and your family. Okay, and this one is from Bruce Christensen. What if I am receiving social security benefits and still working as a commercial photographer? Is there unemployment insurance available to me? And should I be applying for the PPP loan and or the EIDL? That is outside of my pay grade at the moment. I have not looked into the interplay of social security and uh, some of the other things that you mentioned, especially unemployment and, um, and the PPP and the EIDL. 
I, I will, I will say, I want to put a pin in that and that may come back in an article I write. Um, I don't know. Um, uh, I know, Mike, you've been through that bill a lot as well. Do you recall anything specific about provisions? No, it's a, I hadn't thought of that connection. I hadn't either, frankly. Uh, uh, I think it's a good question and we'll try to do a little digging on it, but that is outside of, of what I'm aware of at the moment. Okay, from Daniel Quat. When I filled out the disaster loan assistance, I put zero employees as I was I'm not a W-2 employee. I now know I should have put one. What can I do? So what you can do is you can try to get on the phone with them and talk to them and, you know, um, uh, you know tell them that you changed this. And Based on a number of my clients who have done exactly that, what they will tell you is, wait till we contact you and then we can deal with it then. Do, it, the one thing I've heard over and over again is do not reapply. You don't wanna reapply where you have two applications in there with your EIN connected to your business or your social security number. That looks like you're trying to get multiple advances and multiple loans and all that stuff. If you made a mistake on any of these applications, or you think now that you should have checked one box when you checked another, my advice is you not lose sleep over that. When that application gets in front of someone at the SBA, gets in front of someone at uh, your bank or lender, someone will call you and reach out to you. When they do, if they don't bring it up, you bring it up. Say, hey, I realize after the fact that I should have done this when I did that and then deal with that at that point. Don't start trying to reapply and then calling them and saying, cancel my first one and do this. That is not the SBA. I was talking to a guy from uh, who answers calls at the SBA the other day. And uh, he specifically told me to tell you not to do that. And that applies both to the PPP as well as the EIDL, that advice. Yeah, so the question specifically was about the EIDL, and that is the one, remember, that you apply for through SBA.gov. The PPP you apply for through your bank. It may be a touch different through your bank if you have an ongoing relationship with your lender. Another example, again, we've already talked about exp my experiences. I bank with Chase, right? And if I, they, after they accepted my application, were very explicit, do not call us, do not email us. We can't answer you. You can't change anything at the moment. When we process your application, we'll reach out to you if we need more information. If I made a mistake on that and I wanted to call them up and change it, there's no one who will talk to me about it. If you are a member of a very small community bank or lending institution and you know that you're a banker, give them a call and ask them, by all means. But I will tell you that it is almost never the right idea to file a second application. Okay, now this one is from Robert Jones. My bank has said that I am approved for a PPP loan, applied on April 8th, but they said today that they can't send it until, to SBA until more money is made available. As of today, they anticipated more money would be available in the next day or so. Given what I know to be true on Capitol Hill, that doesn't seem right. Does that seem right to you, Tom or Mike? No. No, and, and I think here we're, we may be running into a, this is very lawyerly, but some definitional problems, right? So many of the big banks have said, these are the steps. You apply, your application is received, the application then goes to the SBA, the SBA approves it, meaning that they will support the bank and pay back the bank the amount if you know you do the thing it then comes back to your bank and the bank still at that point has to go through its loan processes to disperse the money what i understand to be the case right now is that if you have been told you are approved that money has been allocated to your bank for them to disperse if your bank has told you they don't have the money then and you have to wait for the program to be funded again, I think they're using the word approved wrong. What they're saying is they've received your application and they may have processed your application. They may have sent your application off, but 
the SBA is not approving applications until they get more money. They are, they are explicitly talking about the fact that they're not accepting them and they're not, they've already come out with everyone who's been approved in this first round. Once there's more money, the, the machine will start rolling again. But it sounds like the bank may be saying something different or using the incorrect words. If, if they've told you you've been approved, but they have to wait for the government to get more money, then it sounds like you haven't been approved. Okay, great. That's helpful. Thank you. And this one, you know, it's sort of Robert and Kate asked this in sort of different ways, but I guess it's, you know, I think it's the same kind of question in a way. The SBA said it originally it was and has given apparently ten thousand dollars to some companies, but now they're saying it's into ten a thousand per employee. Why do those calculations matter if we're only, I mean, in, in terms of filling them out and putting them in on forms, if they're only giving a hundred, a thousand per employee? And, you know, but, are, are small, small businesses being penalized in your opinion? That's a political question, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I, I think two things. One, um, uh, Anecdotally, we've heard of businesses with fewer than 10 employees getting, you know, $10,000, which is different than the guidance that came out earlier this week. The reason that the SBA says they switched to this $1,000 per employee thing is to help make the money last longer. I, you know, I, it's, I won't opine as to my, my thoughts on that. What I will say in general is that uh, our small businesses being, um, uniquely singled out, um, uh, pr probably. Uh, when this program came out, and if you listened to me five weeks ago and four weeks ago, I was real excited because I thought this $10,000 advance, one, would be paid quickly, right? And two, would be paid in its entirety. Almost no one I know has gotten any money from it. And now, the amount of money from it, if you certainly have fewer than 10 employees, and especially if you're a one or two person operation, is a lot less than you were thinking it was. And I don't think that Congress necessarily thought that it would be reduced like this. But Congress gave the authority to the SBA to decide. So another great reason why advocacy is so important. I think, you know, as Tom and Mike talk about this with people up on the Hill, I, a great argument would be, look, for almost a month, you said this thing was $10,000 advance. You put it all out in the, on the websites, in the news, $10,000 for small businesses. Well, that's not the case. And uh, is it fair? It's likely not fair, but also, is there anything you can do about it? Absolutely not, except advocate for the future. When filing, and this is from Mary Raftery, a Schedule C for 2019 or 2018? when applying? Everything in the recent treasury guidance, which came out a few days ago, says 2019. Now, I know we've had some questions. What if I didn't work a lot in 2019, but I did in 2018? I had a family issue in 2019. Something else happened. I, you know, my guidance last week was that you can work with your lender to figure that out. I think lenders' hands are a lot more tied right now because that treasury guidance specifically says 2019. And banks are going to say, what can I do? It's 2019, right? Before there was specific guidance, I think your bank may have been more able to work with you. Now, I don't know. That's a up in the air question. But 2019 is the answer. Okay, a, qu a Facebook question from Bobby Lane. PPP is only good for eight weeks, correct? Therefore, and un unemployment is good until the end of the year. Uh, so wouldn't it be better to go, go for unemployment? Right. If you're assuming so, that the pandemic is going to last, you know, well into right. the fall. So two things about that. One, PPP is only for eight weeks that from the day you get it, you have to spend that money on the approved things if you want it to be forgiven. But that amount of money is usually, I don't want to say usually, that amount of money is, is as close as you can get to free money that isn't, that doesn't penalize someone. When I say penalize, what I mean is if you own a business, 
and you file for unemployment insurance, then remember it's at a state level. Here in Texas, that affects different things in the future related to unemployment claims and insurance and percentages and everything else. Right now, that's not a huge issue. I wouldn't worry about it too much. The other thing to remember, though, is that um, uh, the amount, that extra $600 a week amount does not last 30 nine weeks. I forget. Mike, do you remember how long that lasts? No, I don't. I had to go look it up. It's a much, much shorter period of time. (laughs) Um, And what I mean by that is after a month or two, you are only going to get what your state offers you. I think the average here in Texas is something like $100 a week, $200 a week, something like that. And so when you get the state, the $600 a week thing on top of that, that's only for a short period of time. And we'll try to find before the end of the the program what that is. I've said this in every town hall so far, you have to sit down and do the calculations as to which route is the best for you. I think for most people, the PPP route is the best if you can actually get funded and, um, and get money in the door. I just saw a message in chat that said July 31 for the extra $600. So 13 weeks. So it, while unemployment under the CARES Act lasts 39 weeks, you only get that extra money for 13 weeks. Still long time. And so you may really want to think about it, but it makes the calculus a little closer than just assuming, you know, this lasts till December and this only lasts eight weeks. All right. Now this is from Doug Unitas. If I applied for an EDL previously, but never received a response, can I still apply in the next lending round, assuming that that's going to happen, which we believe that all all of us believe it will? Never received a response. Uh, that means one of two things. You never got a confirmation that your application was submitted. If that's the case, then you definitely should reapply because that application, you should have gotten an, an email confirmation from the SBA like the next day. Uh, after you submitted your EIDL application. But if what you mean by you never got a response is that you got that application submitted confirmation and then you never heard again, that means your application is still in the queue somewhere and that when they get more money, they're going to end up getting to it. Big caveat here, when they get more money, the SBA may say, hey, if you haven't already got money, reapply. They may say that. I don't think they will but we got to listen to what they say when the money comes back around. Right now, I would say when it opens up again, don't reapply unless you're told to. Okay, and here's a question from our Twitter feed, Jen in Atlanta. I applied on April 1st for EDIL, EIDL. On the 14th, I got a generic reply to the status email I had sent and about and an email about reduced grants amounts later that morning, which we've talked about. have heard nothing further since. She's been out of work since... March 14th, what should I do? By all means, don't wait on the EIDL. Go ahead and um, reach out, take a look at the, your state's unemployment website, figure out what's available um, for you uh, during that route. Again, I am not going to tell anyone to put their eggs in an EIDL PPP basket right now. When there's money again, I may change my tune a little bit, but Probably not, frankly. I don't know if they put in an extra $250 billion, which I think is a number that's been thrown around, how long that's going to last. $350 billion was spent in 13 days. Are we going to have to do this whole thing again, you know, after seven days of opening it back up? Who knows? So I think that in general, my thought is if you you haven't had any income coming in, you need to take care of yourself and your family. The, the lifeline now is not EIDL and it's not PPP. It's going to be the state unemployment office. Okay. This is from Alan Kirchner. Regarding PPP forgiveness requirements, for a sole proprietor, if an owner's salary is based on the Schedule C, line 31, is it not, nece- not acceptable to claim one-twelfth of that amount per month as a simple straight line salary payment without further explanation? That is what you do, right? So if we go back and look at the, um, at the slides that I had, step one is you look at line 31 of your Schedule C. Step two is you divide that by 12. 
Step three is that you multiply that number by 2.5 and that's your loan amount for the PPP. You nailed it, you got it right. I think um, the only difference is that when Treasury is talking about sole proprietors now and Schedule Cs, they're talking about not your payroll costs, but they're talking about your net income. So you may now see some different terminology, but the bottom line is if you are a sole proprietor self-employed, if you file a Schedule C, you go to the Schedule C, go to line 31, divide by 12, and then multiply that by 2.5. And that is on the Treasury website and uh, under most recent guidance. And actually, I will put that link into chat right now. Okay. This one from Matt Levere. Do you know if there's been any clarification or elaboration on what borrowers and the government are determining as utilities? He's curious to know if things like equipment liability insurance, disability insurance, and services like Dropbox, Squarespace, and Adobe Creative Cloud are considered utilities. Yeah. Um, I'm making a note here because that is going to be something that I answer in that next article about ha uh, how to get forgiveness on your PPP loan. Um, and again, I'm going to have to go back into the law and determine, you know, what our best guess is. I will tell you that um, that that answer to that question, I will give it to you in the next town hall, and I will put a big star by it because I think we're going to get five or six rounds of guidance from Treasury as to what kind of things count for that before the end of the day. Uh, remember, that is gonna come into play most when, when they're talking about forgiveness, which is eight weeks after people get money. I think right now, they're just trying to get people money, but it is important for you to know what's gonna actually count and what doesn't. The law says, you know, everything we've read says business utilities, but you're right. What does that even mean? We'll try to do some digging and find that out for you. Okay, and this is another health-related question from Katie Varnke. Can we be still photographing outside? And can we use our ASMP membership card and the media credentials on the back of it to show that we're media when we're outdoors? And I presume that this is in a state where there's restrictions on being outside at this point in time. Hmm. This is in Colorado. The first half of that I felt really confident answering. The second half is a little trickier. Um, the first half, can you take photos outside? Well, I think you have to evaluate any kind of stay at home order that you're under, but you know, I, most stay at home orders allow, um, allow you to be outside for, uh, you know, certain activities, exercising and things like that. Um, I don't think that if you're in the middle of Colorado, all alone on a mountain taking pictures that a cop's going to come and hassle you but I also don't know what the stay at home order says. The second piece is a little trickier. The second piece says, can you use the ASMP membership card, which on the back has essentially media credentials to show your local government that you are a member of the media and therefore exempt from uh, the, non uh, the stay at home or the non-essential work uh, you know, order. I mean, you know, my answer here is not is not one based on my opinion. My answer here now is I'm putting on my general counsel hat for the organization and and saying I don't necessarily want to get a call from a governor saying, you know, ASMP members are running around saying they're media and they don't do media work. What I am going to say is that you are involved in a profession that is um, is vital to providing information and experience to people around the world based on where you are and what you do in your community. That is the expansive reading that I have given to the idea of media. There is a public service and a public policy benefit to you taking pictures and providing your experiences and pictures to the world. So, my answer is that I believe that you could do that if you are working in the spirit of your local ordinances. Okay, now here's, the, this is kind of the second part or you know, corollary to the question that I think is really interesting from Andy Ryan in New York. 
where in New York State they've kind of deemed what are the non-essential businesses, and that if if they're found to be operating, they can be subject to fines up to ten thousand dollars. How does Andy or anyone else know if photography is considered an essential business or a non-essential business? You don't know, um, and that is an incredibly disappointing answer. I will go back to something that I, uh, you know, that I've said a few times, which is. Uh, I'm here in Dallas, and right next door to me is a city called Arlington, and Arlington is in a different county than Dallas. We both have a, a stay-at-home order, essential, non-essential business order that is almost word-for-word word the same, except five miles to my east, they view essential businesses in a totally different light than my county does. does what does that actually mean in practice? It means... I cannot give a blanket that photography is essential or non-essential. I mean, it's a, um, uh, what I think you have to look at is what the purpose of the order is in relation to you and your community. If you are a photojournalist, you are essential. I will say that. If you are a, um, a photographer, if you're a wedding photographer and you have no wedding scheduled, and you are not necessarily working, uh, 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 you're not working in your business, you're not working for media, you're not working in that kind of thing, you're likely non-essential. And again, it has nothing to do with the worth of you or your business, it has to do with what the purpose is. There's a reason that we, we would say photojournalists and media are essential, and there's a reason that we would say some retail stores are non-essential, right? doesn't relate to how good they are. It relates to what is considered essential and that changes from state to state and county to county. Okay, this is a question from Patrick on Facebook. How do payments of past assignments from clients impact the application process and acceptance of unemployment compensation, uh, you know, assistance? Great question. And, and I, I think I fielded this one, not in the last town hall, but somewhere else, which is, if I build a client and they haven't paid me yet and I go get unemployment and then I get money in the door, is, that, is the unemployment office going to say that I'm making money on the side? I talked with someone from uh, the Texas Workforce Commission, which is Texas's, and so I'm going to preface this by saying this is just one person. But the, uh, the general uh, feeling I got and the advice that I got on this was that if you've built something and done the work in the past and you just haven't quite been paid yet, they're not going to hold that against you um, when determining how much you, uh, uh, how much you are allowed under an unemployment uh, system. And they're not going to say, well, you're working some side job now. Look at all you're bringing in. As a general rule, the unemployment offices, according to some of the people I talked to, will um, recognize that as a payment for past services and you wouldn't be penalized for that. Okay, this question from David Wells. He was able to, thanks to our webinars, I appreciate the shout out, David, uh, said that he was able to successfully acquire some PPAP funds as well as uh, get eligibility for state unemployment. Now he wants your wise advice about reconciling the two and on how to make the PPP money forgiven. So, the first thing is the PPP money is actually pretty clear in terms of, of how you should deal with that. And by the way, I mean, you've gotten unemployment assistance and PPP money. You're a rock star. Way to go. Um, uh, and I'm glad you got a lot of benefit from the webinars. Uh, I'll give you my address and you can mail me a, a cut here in a little bit. Um, what I really think you need to think about is is the PPP money acting entirely separate from your personal unemployment money? Remember last week we talked about how you, those two things can coexist, right? But you have to use the PPP money for precisely what they say you can use it for, okay? So if you're the only employee, that means one thing. If you have other employees, that might mean something different. You, though, you will not be able to call the SBA and probably ask them a question. What I would do if I were in this situation is I would pay close attention and track 
the PPP money very, very closely. Some people I know are setting up a, P, a separate account for PPP money so they can prove to their bank that they used it just for these things. That's not a terrible idea, okay? Now, you know, try to go get an account at a bank and get someone to open something. That may be uh, trouble right now. But you really want to make sure you can prove that. That's step one. The second step may be to call and talk to your unemployment office and simply lay it out. What I don't want to have happen to anyone is that we get three months, six months from now, and you get some bill from your state, or you are told by your bank that they're not going to forgive something because you were able to obtain money from different sources and it just wasn't traced right or it wasn't tracked right. Um, now, one thing you'll find, and I've noticed this again in the chat today, a lot of state unemployment offices are not are are not ready. They don't know what's going on. Okay. Start with the PPP, make sure you trace that and track that most importantly, and then reach out to your unemployment office and figure out how you necessarily treat that money. That's a hard one, but that's a good question. Okay, here's another one from Bobinas Jenkins. I got my PPP and EIDL applications in a couple of weeks ago. At the time, I supplied my tax return from 2018, but since I hadn't yet filed for 2019, I sent them my 2019 PNL. I have subsequently been denied for the first round. Um, wanted to know if I want to reapply with the, now that he's filed his 2019 taxes and would do that before the next round, do you think it would work if I reapply with my 2019 return included? He's working right now, trying to work through the Chase Bank and the process is pretty complicated and yeah. he's not getting a lot of help with that bank. Yeah, no, uh, I understand. Um, what I think, what I think you have to do is figure out why you were denied. If all they said is denied, you don't know that it's not be, that it's because you provided one document because when you uploaded that document, Chase said on their upload portal, you can use this tax return or this profit and loss or X, Y, Z. They're going to change that now because of the new guidance from Treasury. But that should not be in and of itself, the reason that you were denied. There, if there's a mechanism for you to talk to someone up there now that you've had a, uh, a decision on your loan, if there's a mechanism to do that, okay, then you want to figure out why you were denied first before you apply again using something else. But that by all means, next time you apply, then send them what they need. My understanding is that if the only thing that was preventing you from, from being approved was the fact that you gave them one document when they needed another, my understanding is that they would have contacted you to ask for the other document and not just flat denied you. It doesn't mean it didn't take place. That means do a little more investigation. And this is sort of a related question from Andy Ryan. If we haven't, d haven't done the filing and produced this, 2019 Schedule C, should we wait until that's completed before applying? And also he wants to know, do we apply for the EIDL and the PPP directly with SBA or do with the local bank? Yeah. So when everything opens up, you apply for the EIDL at sba.gov. That's there, that's that piece of it. You apply for your PPP with your bank or lender, okay? You don't apply at sba.gov, two separate places. Now, to answer your question, should you use that new thing in uh, the, the 2019 Schedule C? It's not should you, it's now you have to. So the next time you apply, even if your bank accepted other documentation before, they're gonna require you to give that this time around because of the new guidance that came out from Treasury a few days ago. And Tom, as you know, this is from Megan Bearder, the EIDL loan application form itself was simplified last week. And prior to that time, Megan had gone ahead and applied. And now that the funds are dried up, she want, she's 
she wants to know if she's still in line to receive the money, should she go ahead and send in all the tax forms that they were requiring before they simplified the application? Okay, I wanna make sure we're all talking about the same thing here. Um, the EIDL loan, the application at sba.gov was a paper application and then about three and a half weeks ago it switched to an online application and the difference there was that the online application had a box to check for the EIDL advance okay if you submitted the online application with the box to check for the EIDL advance that is you don't need to reapply the SBA said early on that if you had given, if you had submitted a paper application for the EIDL that didn't have any mention of any kind of advance, you should reapply using the online system. That is the only time you should reapply. If you applied with a paper application back in January or February or early March, and now the online application is up, and this is for the EIDL, okay? then you should reapply. Now, what confused me about that question was that you said that they're now asking you for documentation. Well, that sounds a little bit more like the PPP, although it could be the EIDL. Frankly, not enough people have been approved or awarded this money for me to know exactly which one we're talking about. But if your bank has simplified the online process, you shouldn't reapply there. They already have the thing. If you're talking about the SBA, my line in the sand, to use a great analogy from earlier, is if you applied via the online process and you're being asked for documentation, go ahead and provide that. You don't need to reapply. If it was the paper thing, you might need to look a little harder at that. That is one where I would stay on hold for the SBA representative. And remember, the SBA is also open for phone calls Saturday and Sunday till like, I think, 8 p.m., and you get a lot better response if you try to call Sunday afternoon than you do on a, on a Monday morning. So you will be on hold a lot less. Okay, and I wanna go back to Alan Kartmer's question earlier because he was asking about if the, uh, regarding PP forgiveness for, uh, requirements for sole proprietor, talking about owner's salaries based on Schedule C, line 31. And then when I get down uh, here, hang on, I'm scrolling. Uh, la, 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 where did I just see it? The, thanks for answering my question, but I was not talking about what to claim, but rather what to report to confirm that it was used for a forgivable expense. What to report on your Schedule C or what to report? And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm sure this answer is obvious, but I'm missing it. Yeah, I'm, um, missing, I'm trying to ask the question I mean, as best as I can. Yeah, I, I think you know, your net income on your Schedule C, line 31, is calculated however it's calculated. It has nothing to do with these programs, okay? You just calculate it based on normal tax accounting standards. And remember, I haven't said this today, but boy, it's still true. I'm not a tax preparer or attorney or accountant. That's not my world. You, you figure out what your Schedule C is, what your line 31 is, and then you got that. Now that is the number you divide by 12 and multiply by 2.5. To, to prove forgiveness, you are going to be asked to provide the net income number off your Schedule C so that you don't show that you paid yourself you know, more or whatever than you should have so that you can have that loan forgiven. Okay, I hope that was somewhat clear. Okay, from Bruce Christensen. If you don't have a 2019 Schedule C, I was asked to fax in 1099s for 2019 instead. Is this okay? Yeah, okay. So one thing I didn't mention here because we spent a lot of time on other stuff is that if you're an independent contractor and you bring in money and you only have 1099s, well, one, you might have filled out a different kind of other income form and it's line seven, you know, that kind of thing. But if for some reason you don't have a Schedule C, but you have 1099s, 1099s can be corroborating evidence even under these new treasury rules. And um, let me, uh, I actually can pull off some of this somewhere, maybe here in a second. But the short answer is that 
your bank or lender asks you for info, you provided the info they asked for, that is info that can help support. But frankly, right now, if any banks are accepting applications, they're going to be asking for a 2019 Schedule C after the new guidance has come out. So maybe they accepted that on Monday. They probably wouldn't accept it today if applications were open. From Adam Coppola. And Tom, I'm just going to do a time check. We're almost up at two hours now, and we've probably got about 35 or 40 more, you know, questions to go. Uh, how, do, how much longer do you want to go, and what do we do for the folks that we might yeah. get to today? Yeah, here's, here's what I want to do. One thing is I'm going to go ahead and film the, the whole presentation I was going to do on Instagram, and we're not going to do a webinar. We're just going to screencast that, and I'm going to – we'll upload it to uh, the site. So if you were – Hear about Instagram, boy, am I sorry that you got two hours of, of, of something else. But um, we're going to get that up for you. If we don't answer your question, and I think I'm, uh, let's, let's go for another 20 minutes till 4.15, Tom. Okay. Uh, if we don't get to your question today, um, you can send your question to, uh, put it, send it through the legal, the COVID-19 hub at ASMP. So go to ASMP.org, click on COVID-19 hub. Um, and, uh, and send in that question there. Uh, we are still compiling a number of these questions and we're gonna try to be providing more resources. But go back and read all the articles we wrote that we've been updating now. Let me say very clearly, the, and it says at the top of all the articles related to the CARES Act, that has not been updated with the brand new treasury information that I gave you in this presentation yet. That's gonna occur in the next, 10 hours or so. I have to send that letter to Instagram first and then we're going to get that done. It doesn't really change our advice too much, frankly. Okay. Our advice was, was pretty spot on for all that, but um, it, we're going to put in some new quotes from treasury. So read all those articles first. They're going to have a lot of answers. Okay. And just to, for everybody's uh, edification, I've put in a link in the chat box now where Tom, the, what Tom was referring to as the form that we're using to, uh, f help fuel and power the questions, responses to questions that we're getting. From Megan Bearder, is there a consequence to paying for unemployment if one is the sole person on the payroll for their S Corp, e i.e., will my taxes rates go up? Would I owe more money in some way? Ha have had the S Corp for four years. That is one of those provisions that I want to double check. Um, uh, I think there's a clear answer to that in the CARES Act, which will either say, you know, people applying under, under the pandemic uninsurance um, or unemployment uh, assistance program that will not adversely affect um, your unemployment insurance tax rate. It may not say that. Um, I know that states are going to be loath to give up that additional income because they have to pay the unemployment. Remember, the state's paying and then the government's paying that $600 on top. Um, I'm going to get you an actual real answer to that. But uh, you may find that, that those increase in taxes are offset by tax credits in the future. But I think the the increase in taxes will accrue to the business based on normal unemployment uh, insurance things in your state. Remember, every state's different. For example, uh, in Texas, we don't have, businesses don't have to pay uh, income tax unless they make more than uh, like a million dollars a year or something. But we do have to pay unemployment insurance tax. Um, and I have not yet heard back, and I've actually asked this question, I've not yet heard back from the Texas Workforce Commission if that's going to increase people's rates if they are filing for unemployment as a result of the pandemic. If they're filing for unemployment as a result of something else, you just fired them for some other reason, then yeah, your taxes are going to go up. If it's a result of the pandemic, there may be uh, some out clauses there, but I'm not positive. Okay, this is another one from Sarah. Is there a way, and this is, this is definitely uh, riffing off of something that I've heard anecdotally, which is that actually the IRS checks for the $1,200 or the, you know, whatever, $600, that they've gone into bank accounts that were actually closed and therefore people haven't received their money. Is there a way to 
for are the banks obligated to notify you when the money's de been deposited and is there a way to check to see if the funds have actually been deposited incorrectly into other accounts I really don't know that. Um, I would presume that if money is deposited into an account that is no longer active, the bank would treat it as any other unclaimed property type issue. They may or may not reach out to you. I, I really don't, I, I don't know that there's a mandate that they have to. Um, I would think that when the IRS gets the government portal back up that says, where's my payment? And it says your payment's been sent to this account, or you can assume that the payment was sent to whatever direct deposit account you had on the taxes from last year. Then you may say, oh, well, I closed that account and you call up that bank and figure out from them how you get a hold of that money. Um, the What may happen is that the money can't be deposited into a closed account and so it bounces back to the government and then the government writes you a check. Now they'll mail it to whatever address is on your tax return. And maybe you've moved from that address and then you have to deal with mail forward. This is a lot of words to say, gosh, I don't know, obviously we're gonna have to deal with that. What I might do if I knew I had closed my bank account where I think this money is going, I would call that bank and I would say, hey, I closed my account. I think this money's going there. Advise me as to what I need to do so that I don't miss out on this money. Okay, this is from Kaveh Sardari. If I apply for unemployment, I should no longer pay myself on my payroll for my S Corp. Is that correct? Well, uh, I, um, uh, did you get a Paycheck Protection Program loan? And if you did, then you have to pay yourself because that loan, 75% of it has to be used for payroll, right? Now, if you're saying you didn't get that and you are now on unemployment, you have to prove to the unemployment office that when you bring in money um, uh, from your business, I mean, there's only two options. If you have no business, so you are applying for unemployment, I mean, that means you're not making money, then you can't pay yourself anyway from the escort. That, uninsurance, that unemployment money doesn't go back into your company, which then you pay yourself. That's just your, your money. If you have gotten a Paycheck Protection Program loan, most of the time you have to tell your state unemployment office. I think that's going to end up being the rule. And then they might lower your unemployment assistance amount based on how much PPP money you've gotten in so that you can continue to pay yourself. Remember, the PPP is designed to allow you to continue to pay your employees. If you're your only employee of an S Corp, then the unemployment office is not gonna to wanna to pay you 100% when you're already getting paid the equivalent of at least 75% for the next two months. Okay, so this, it is, depends. this is from Barbara Alper. How does the PUA work with the UI? On the New York labor site, it says that my UI is pending, but then I get an email, got an email saying that I had to apply for PUA because my UI was denied. I'm a sole proprietor, self-employed. I understand the PUA is for the 600 in addition to whatever UI is given. Can you explain this? Yes. So what I have heard from New York and Texas, by the way, and, and uh, this was brought up not only in chat, but with one of my clients here, is that if you, you have to apply for unemployment in your state and you put down sole proprietor or independent contractor, whatever you put down, many states will not accept that category as unemployed. So you will be denied. What I heard from an ASMP member in New York just the other day is that they tried to file the PUA and the unemployment application at the same time, and they were told, no, you have to file the unemployment, get denied, and then file the PUA. Does the $600 sit on top of whatever your state offers? Yes, but if your state doesn't offer anything, then it doesn't sit on top. Then it only is what it is, right? Remember, every state's different. Um, some states offer unemployment assistance to uh, uh, categories of workers that other states don't. And so the 600 will sit on top, but what it seems to be 
what it seems to be based on just anecdotal evidence we're seeing from different states is that you have to, uh, you have to apply at some point for the UI of your state. And then when that's denied, you apply for the, the pandemic unemployment. The question I would ask my state is, do I apply together or separately? That would be the first question. Okay, from Ryan Shanley, I am an online English teacher, but I do not have any work for my business as a photographer. Can I still apply for unemployment? Well, the way that when you apply for unemployment, they ask you what job are you unemployed from and how much did you make and all that kind of stuff. If you're an online English teacher and that's the bulk of your money from the last year, then no, you probably couldn't. If you, the bulk of your money was from being a photographer and now you have no photography jobs, yes, you can, but the unemployment office will have formulas to decrease the amount of assistance based on what other money you're bringing in from other jobs. And that changes from, from state to state. The short answer is that can you apply for unemployment? Absolutely. Most likely. Um, the the question is, how much will you get and will it be reduced by the amount that you're making from being an online English teacher? And the answer to that is almost certainly yes. Okay. From Sarah, I was paid via payroll W-2 for a photo job I did a month ago. I was already approved for unemployment at that point and certified the weeks that I did, certified the weeks that I did not work. However, the payment date is on that week. What should I do? Will this look like I lied about working? Is there a certain percentage of money I can make and still collect unemployment? This is an excellent example of a question that I will give you a general answer on, which will probably be disappointing, but a question that we can't answer specifically, right? Because I have, I have no idea what all the exact facts are and further, I don't know how your state unemployment office treats situations like this. The general advice is get on the phone with them and tell them what's going on and let them figure it out. What I want everyone to do, and this is always a recommendation, but let me just make it really explicit. I want everyone to be absolutely candid with all of the, the banks and the, the states and the governments and everything else and you will find that if you are just very clear about what you've received and what you haven't and everything else, then you will probably get the best advice. You will someday, these, these organizations are going to figure out if something, you know, uh, kind of under the table happened. And you're exactly right to think the way you're thinking. Call that unemployment office. Tell them the dates of things. Tell them what happened. And they'll help you figure it out. And if it means you forego a little bit of money right now, that's a lot more preferable than being accused of, uh, of defrauding the government. Oh. All right, Tom? Bruce, yeah, I'm here. Sorry, I was just looking and scrolling through the questions. Um, David Seide, my 2019 income revenue was low. It appears that my NYS UI benefits might be based on the prevailing UI wages. A photographer comes in at a whopping 30822 an hour. I've also read that it can't be lower than 104 per week minimum and a maximum of 504 a week. Any insight thoughts on, how the, on this calculation or should I just sit tight and wait? Uh, you should just sit tight and wait. I mean, my thoughts as I was listening is, is what you're experiencing is what photographers in all 50 states are experiencing, and they're all experiencing it differently. And um, like I said, and I don't want to be a broken record, we're going to try to put some general parameters around this, but I absolutely have no idea how you get the New York Unemployment Office to give you higher amounts based on this year or that year. And, um, and I doubt I could probably get one of them on the phone to even ask at the moment. And so we're gonna try to give you some high level guidance. I know there's a lot of photographers in all the different states and we're, we are gonna be providing some resources in the next week where photographers where you are in all different chapters can provide resources and experiences that might help each other on a local level. 
and that's something that you you'll be hearing more about okay here's a very interesting question from thomas feisel a friend of mine a freelancer who worked in ohio for years and but allowed his id in ohio to expire after he moved to utah six months ago he's not allowed to file for unemployment in ohio because his id is invalid but he's also not allowed to file in utah because he hasn't lived there long enough any advice Uh, um, first of all, that feels like I'm back in law school. Um, this is a question that might not have an answer. Um, I will presume you've tried to call Ohio and Utah, right? Uh, and talk to two people there. I know this is going to sound out of left field and maybe Tom and Mike can help me, you know, can help tell me if this is a dumb idea, but um, this is the type of thing that maybe a Congressman's office might be able to help. With. Would, would you even approach? I, I can't think of who to talk to. Um, it they, would be the, un go ahead, Mike. Who are they requesting the unemployment from Utah? I would I think, think Utah. Yeah. yeah. It's, he's based in Utah now. Yeah, but he hasn't lived there long enough, I guess, to meet some the of the residents who are required for unemployment. Yeah. Well, that's a. I. I that's. I, I, you know, here's. Here. Okay. Yeah. I'll give you uh, my, my bottom. My first step for you would be. The unemployment office in Utah has already told you you haven't been there long enough. There has to be some appeals process or some other process that can help you. They very well may just say, no, go back to Ohio. And then you might have to go through the process over there. That is a tricky one. And I don't have a good answer. No. Okay, a number of people are asking about the EIDL and the fact that they've received an appli application number when they completed the application in the new on window online and hit send but there's but they they've never received any kind of follow up email should they be concerned that the application was not actually received no here's why i'm in your boat i have that one thing i've never heard one peep in the last 12 days the 14 days the law says they're supposed to talk to us within 3 days they're not doing it. They don't have the manpower. They're just not doing it right now. Um, the only benefit that I can see about the fact that these programs are slightly paused is hopefully it gives them a chance to process some of the things that without new things coming in that are already, you know, applied for. Uh, I have no idea if they're doing that or not. Everything may be furloughed until new money comes in. I really don't know. But I would not worry about that. If you have that application confirmation number, you are in the right line to be in. Okay, I think that's probably pretty close um, to All the right. end. Let me ask one last one from David Seide. If we get PUA, will we need to verify with the unemployment office that we are looking for work in order to get the benefits, or is PUA exempt from sort of doing that on kind of on? typical work search requirement that's associated with normal unemployment assistance. So remember the PUA is being paid, which is the $600 a week thing for 13 weeks. The PUA is being paid through to you, but essentially through the states, meaning you are likely going to have to abide by the same rules that the states have, but that may there are provisions in the cares act which i'm going to again hopefully get into that allow that a state can't start making rules that would eliminate the pua uh, they can't say well you know uh, we're only going to give you this amount even though the law says we have to give you that amount uh, they can't say you don't get the pua because you're an independent contractor that's specifically in the law when it comes to, do you have to attest that you, you know, are looking for work or, or can't find a job or, you know, that kind of thing, I'm almost positive it's going to revert to the underlying state's rules. 
but let me see if there's anything in the CARES Act about that and put a pin in that till next Wednesday uh, and we'll have something in there about that. Good okay. question. All right, one last question. How does one file for unemployment as a freelance business? I do a part-time job, I have a part-time, I do have a part-time job teaching photography as well. So the way you file is you go to your state's unemployment office and you will uh, click on wherever it says file. And guess what? You are likely not going to see an option for what you need because most states won't accept freelancers in their unemployment program. But you then have to figure out how your state is dealing with the PUA, the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Provision of the CARES Act, which does allow for freelancers. That's where I go back to different states are doing it different ways, right? And so you got to figure out how your state wants those applications to come in. I just heard here in Texas and a couple others, they don't even, or uh, uh, I saw in the chat, a couple of states don't even have anything on their website about applying for PUA. They say we're not set up for it yet. So if you're in one of those states, you probably can't do anything right now. You probably have to keep an eye on what the state on, on that, uh, on the unemployment website. Um, but the, the underlying uh, question is how do you apply as a freelancer? The states are going to have a path to apply through the PUA as a freelancer, but it sounds like many of them don't even have that path yet. Keep checking back. Okay, and Mike Clipper, do you have any last words before we close out? No, I, I just want to applaud Tom for his mastery of this very complicated, ever-changing situation. All right. Well, I, I appreciate that. And I want to thank everybody for being on today and participating with us in these town halls. We obviously are going to continue to do these and try to be of service to all of you as we all navigate the uncharted waters of this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, really appreciate everybody being on and asking all these great questions. And Tom, thank you so much for your time and uh, powering through all this and continuing to provide all the great information that you are doing. As we said, Tom and Mike and I are continuing to put information up on the website on an almost daily basis, if not hourly basis, and we'll continue to do that. You should be continuing to check back to our website for the latest updates. We also will be continuing to do our Wednesday series with experts who have particular things to offer. And next week we're looking at having Michael Shea on with a guest who will talk about how to work remotely in your studio with uh, art directors who may not be on site. Uh, so I think that'll be pretty interesting. Uh, I want to thank everybody again and I want to also thank uh, Stretch Ledford and Doug Pizak and Jake Campos for running the technical support that enables us to also field questions from Twitter stream and from Facebook Live. So again, thanks everybody. Stay safe and we'll see you soon.